McKelly at Santa Barbara City College in the astronomy program. And we are talking about uh, the chapter 16 material, which is the nature of Milky Way galaxy. And uh, what exactly is the Milky Way galaxy? Is it the entire universe? Or is it just one island in a vast sea, right? Is our galaxy a separate galaxy? We know that's true. Or is it just one whole big collective picture that we call the universe? And that was called the Great Debate. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about different kinds of galaxies today. And um, and yeah, just the final little details for our course. I just want to point out I'm wearing my lucky shirt just for you. And so as you watch this today, you know that um, I am I'm here for you. If you have any questions about the course, um, please feel free to contact me. Schedule some office hour time. Okay. All right. So here we are, chapter 16. Uh, there's the idea of the island universe, which means that there are separate little islands uh, in the vast universe. We know that's true, but we didn't know that it was true, uh, you know, a hundred years ago. It's actually uh, about 1930 we discovered um, that the Milky Way is its own little island, uh, a galaxy, uh, amongst a, a huge vast ocean, and the nearest galaxies are are actually pretty close to us. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, we did talk last time, by the way, about the Andromeda galaxy coming to visit. We'll mention that in a few minutes as well. Okay, so there was something called the Great Debate. And as I just said, uh, it, it has to do with the size of the universe, right? Is the universe, everything that we can see around us, is that pretty much it? And, and the reason um, this question came up is that there were some special features that were visible um, in the night sky. And if you were back in the, you know, 100 years ago, 1920, one of the amazing things to look at in the night sky was something known as the Great Nebula of Andromeda. So remember, nebula means glowing gases. So in fact, we know that the Andromeda, uh, uh, Andromeda is a galaxy, right? It's, it's the nearest spiral galaxy to us, and it's a big one got a trillion stars. It's at least as big as the Milky Way is. Um, but the question is, what is that, right? And, and so they called it a nebula. It's a spiral nebula. And we found a number of them, right? So what are they? They're spiral. Are they just glowing gases? And if they are, then why are they in that shape? Why, why do they have that interesting spiral shape? And as a matter of fact, no one really understood that. They could not figure out a good way to generate a spiral shaped features, right? A spiral shaped object. In fact, we've never seen a nebula like that, to be honest, we've never seen that. And so this was distinctive, but what is the nature of that spiral nebula, especially Andromeda, right? What is it? Is it a nebula or is it an entire galaxy? And we know that's the right answer, but this was the debate, right? This was the debate. So let's talk about the, the two key players in our debate. And one of them we've met before, a new, and then there'll be one new one. So here's Harlow Shapley. We remember him. He was the fellow that um, that actually located the center of the Milky Way by using the globular clusters, right? And so he believed that everything we see is the entire universe. This is it. Everything, all the stars, anything, the nebulas, anything that we see, including the great. Uh, Andromeda Nebula, right? That would have been a great spiral nebula of Andromeda is, is just part of the Milky Way galaxy is part of the, it's the entire universe. That's it, okay? So this is it. And then um, let's compare and contrast, right? So the other fellow that you wanna know about is Hubert Curtis, okay? So Curtis worked at the Lick Observatory, an incredibly powerful, one of the premier telescopes in the world at the time. Uh, that he he was using it in Southern California. The skies were really dark in the mountains there, and they were getting some of the best images of, of the universe that had ever been seen. Okay, so really fantastic. So what he he actually found a number of spiral nebula himself, nebulae, sorry, nebulae himself, and in fact he argued that these nebulae were just look they just look like nebulae. In fact, they were complete galaxies in themselves and that they were very far away 
And so he said that we are just an island. We are just one galaxy in a universe, a vast universe with a multitude of galaxies. So we, in fact, know that's the true answer. But the question is, how do you settle this debate? How do you know that you're an island in a vast ocean, a vast you know, sea of, of space? How do we know that? And so we need, we need a, a, a new player to come and resolve the problem. And so we're going to talk about uh, the work done by Edwin Hubble. So Edwin Hubble solved the problem. He ended the debate. And the reason he ended the debate is because of his research, right? The research that he had been doing. So Hubble studied intensively the Andromeda Nebula, right? At the time it was called the Nebula. We now know it's the Andromeda Galaxy. And, and he studied in particular these variable stars known as Cepheid variables. You might remember Henrietta Swan Levitt, who, who was actually responsible for determining that the period of a variable star is related to its absolute magnitude, right? The period is related to the luminosity. So she gave us this beautiful relationship that Hubble was able to use. So um, here, in fact, is, is some of the original imagery. 1923, you can see this is actually when he discovered it, right? He discovered in the early 1920s when he studied the Cepheid variables, he calculated the distance based on their, the magnitude that he could see. So what he could see with his eye or with his telescope is called the apparent magnitude. He used the, the prediction of the Cepheid uh, luminosity to find the absolute magnitude. And by comparing them, he calculated the distance and he found it was a million light years away. Now, this was incredibly huge compared to any other distance that had been discovered before. So up until now, the star distances were in the thousands of light years, and now suddenly million light years. It just doesn't match. And so this was it. This was the, the, the clincher. This is the, the, the convincing data that made it possible to say those things, those stars are not a part of our galaxy. They are a separate galaxy. Now, he was actually incorrect on the distance, so don't, don't worry about that. It's just a, a minor difference. Um, I mean, same order of magnitude. So it's not 1 million, but you should know the correct distance is about 2.5 million light years away to Andromeda. Okay. And it's a beautiful galaxy. It's just an amazing galaxy. Now, to see an image like this, you really would need a telescope. So this is a spiral galaxy as well, so just like the Milky Way. Right? So we're going to learn the names of a few different kinds of galaxies. You're not really responsible for all of them, but you want to understand that Hubble actually was the first person to really reach out to the universe and start to see, hey, these are separate places, separate islands, right? Each galaxy has billions of stars in it. And we now know there are billions and billions of galaxies, each one with billions and billions of stars. We just live on one of those stars, around one of those stars, right, in our solar system. Uh, so here is, is uh, the, the, the terminology we use, so zoology, a classification of, of, uh, of galaxies. And actually, we're going to learn something called the Hubble tuning fork. And actually, this shows Hubble's belief in how galaxies evolved over time. Okay? So anyways, here we go. So galaxies can be sorted into four main types, spirals, barred spirals, ellipticals, and then this catch-all for anything that doesn't fit, irregular. Okay, so... Um, Anyways, so, uh, um, so we have actually, we, we are living in a barred spiral, if you remember, the Milky Way. Uh, we talked about already some of the details. Um, and it's a typical you know, spiral galaxy. The galactic disk is a radius of 15 kiloparsecs, a diameter of 30 kiloparsecs, and a height or a thickness of about 0.6 kiloparsecs at the edge. Has about 400 billion stars with a mass of about 10 to the 11th solar masses. You can write that down. We're not going to worry too much about the mass, uh, but if you if you keep up, you'll you'll see that not every galaxy has the same amount of mass, and therefore not the same amount of stars either. 
So a grand design spiral is a special kind of spiral galaxy where the, the arms of the spiral galaxy are very clearly defined from the center, from the core, all the way to the edge. So it's called a grand design uh, spiral. Okay. Now, if you, if you look, you will find that some galaxies don't have well-defined arms all the way. There's little gaps. And if you remember the spiral density wave, it may be that you know, the waves of, of star formation leave gaps from time to time. And um, these ones are called flocculent spirals. Again, it's just a, it's a small thing, just to name it. So if you can't see, if there's gaps in the arm, you know, little gaps as you go from, from the beginning, from here to the edge, right? Those gaps are, are what we call a flocculent spiral. Okay, so a barred spiral is one with an elongated center, right? So even though we can't see the entire Milky Way because we're embedded within it, we see other galaxies and we believe that our Milky Way is more like this, right? A more stretched out center. Do you wanna remember why um, this happens? And we talked about it last lecture. It happens when another galaxy passes by, right? And the tidal forces stretch that galaxy and, and cause it to be elongated pretty, pretty permanently, I think. Um, so how does the bar formation occur, right? We just said when another galaxy flies by. The force of gravity from that other galaxy is gonna stretch it because of the tidal force, right? Tidal force is the difference in the force of gravity. So that's the, that's the explanation that I would like you to be able to remember. Okay, so what's an elliptical galaxy? Okay, so elliptical galaxies actually come in, in a variety of shapes, it turns out, but they are um, more like football shape, right? Elongated, egg shape, that would be another idea. But um, the, the, they do have a, a very distinctive uh, three-dimensional nature, right? So they're called triaxial. They're not two-dimensional planes, right? They're not like disks. They really have a three-dimensional shape to them. So it's called triaxial. And um, so we're going to start on this slide telling you a couple of things that you really want to know, want to highlight. This is really important stuff. By the way, Hubble didn't know all of this. So when I tell you what Hubble believed and, and you understand he didn't have some of the, this information, you'll understand why it was wrong, right? Why is this wrong? So ellipticals, if you take a look right here, have little interstellar medium, especially the kind that form stars. So molecular clouds, H1, right, even H2. And if you look at the stars, you find out there are no new stars. There are no O and B stars there, okay? This is important. Hubble didn't know this, right? So when you look at these, um, these galaxies overall, right? The colors that come from them, there's no blue, right? The blues don't show up, right? There's no young hot stars, right? The new star. And so what is the color? Well, the color of an elliptical galaxy is red, redder, really reddish, right? So it may be orange, but anyways, it's redder than a disk galaxy, which has lots of new stars developing. Okay, so um, the other thing to notice is that the ellipticals have a halo in the same way that the Milky Way had a halo, which is full of high temperature gas, that coronal gas. And this may be even 10 million Kelvin. And so actually read the statement, scientists believe that the presence of these hot halos indicate a violent past. Okay, so again, this is information that Hubble did not have. Okay. So if you remember the Chandra Space Telescope was an X-ray telescope, that's how you see high temperature gases, right? 10 million Kelvin emits X-rays. Okay. So we believe that collisions of galaxies are going to be important. We talked last time about the Milky Way and Andromeda uh, colliding. In about 4 billion years, they'll start to rip each other apart. And by 8 billion years, they will have merged and they will actually form an elliptical galaxy when they're finished. Uh, so when you look at an elliptical galaxy, one thing to notice is that the angular momentum of the system is not consistent, right? It's not a single angular momentum. It seems to be all mixed up. And so uh, again, I'm just trying to give you the clues, then we'll talk a little bit more about why this might be. 
And um, so when you watch the stars, they kind of go in every possible direction. They don't have this organized pattern like, like a, a, a spiral galaxy does. They don't go around in a disk. They orbit in every possible direction, kind of chaotically around that central uh, mass of the, of, the, of the galaxy. And then finally, on this page, you can see there's an important little clue again. They have spiral galaxy, as uh, elliptical galaxies have more globular clusters than spiral galaxies do. Remember, the globular clusters are the old clusters uh, that are orbiting around the Milky Way that we know about, right? 157 right now is how many we know. But elliptical galaxies tend to have more. Okay, so what is the mass range of an elliptical galaxy? It turns out that there is a large mass range. In fact, we see dwarf elliptical galaxies to super huge, right? So they can have, actually, instead of 10 to the 11, 10 to the 13th solar masses. Okay, well, that's, that's pretty dramatically bigger. So it could be from 10 to the 8th, uh, about 100 million solar masses, to 10 to the 13th. And I can't even figure that out. 10 to the 12th is trillion. So it's 10 trillion solar masses. Okay, so what's an irregular galaxy? I'll take a look right here. This is an example of an, an irregular galaxy. This is actually, I believe, a picture of the Large Magellanic Cloud. So the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud are both irregular galaxies. They're dwarf irregular galaxies. And uh, what do they look like? A mass, right? They don't have a planar structure. They're not disks, and they don't look like eggs. They don't look like footballs. Um, so what are they? Uh, they're a big mess. So what are they? Why do they look like this? What's going on? So I'm going to say to you that I like the idea. My interpretation is that when we see an irregular galaxy, we are actually catching the universe in the process of colliding two or more galaxies together. I like that, right? And it's just a big mess. It hasn't settled down into the shape of an ellipse yet, for example, an elliptical galaxy. And it's been distorted by the, the tidal forces. We are watching a collision happen, right, in real time. It's very slow, right? This is a very slow process. But if you remember the animation I showed you last lecture of the Andromeda merger with the Milky Way, it makes a big mess in the middle of it, right? So I'm going to tell you that's what I think irregulars are. Okay, so the large and small Magellanic clouds, as I mentioned, are, are called uh, dwarf irregulars or dwarf galaxies or satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. And you may also remember something important. I think I already told you um, that there is something called the large and small Magellanic stream. And what's going on is a stream of material is falling onto the Milky Way from each of these galaxies. What is happening, right? And the answer is, they're so close to the Milky Way, the Milky Way is ripping them apart. And gradually, we are going to see them be absorbed and, and eaten by the Milky Way. They will eventually become a part of the Milky Way. So the large Magellanic Cloud has a mass of about 10 to the 10th solar mass, about a 10th the mass of our Milky Way, and um, at 4.3 kiloparsecs across. Compare that to 30 kiloparsecs. Cross, right? So this is actually just like one-tenth again, a little more than one-tenth. And then the small Magellanic Cloud has about the same order of magnitude, a little bit smaller, and only two kiloparsecs in size. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. These are small, right? So these are smaller galaxies. We call them dwarfs. Um, so this is what's called the uh, Hubble's tuning fork. And I want to walk you through this. This is kind of an, an important concept, right? We want to think about how Hubble thought but also understand that this is not correct, right? This is not the way that galaxies are, are organized over time, right? In fact, it's probably backwards, almost backwards, right? But let's talk through like what Hubble saw. He said that the earliest galaxy that we could see is something that looks spherical right here. And so if I want you to, I want you to look back in your memory about how does a galaxy form? We know that a galaxy must come from a big mass of gas and dust and whatever, right? Some stuff. And what's going to happen is it's going to collapse, right? But when it begins, it might look roughly spherical. So he said the earliest 
elliptical galaxy. It looks like a circle, so it looks like a sphere, right? It would be called an E0. Now, what happens is the matter begins to collapse. It rotates faster and begins to flatten, right? So he said, that's what we're seeing, right? When you see this thing, it looks more elongated. The reason it looks that way is it's we're seeing it flattening out. So this is the progression, E0, E1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. He said there'd be like nine steps until finally we get to S0. Now S0 is actually a spiral galaxy, but it has no arms. So it's actually called a lenticular galaxy, okay? So um, anyways, S0 would be the beginning of a spiral galaxy with no arm formation yet. And then the interesting thing Hubble said is that there's two distinctive pathways, right? If it starts to develop arms, we see the arms develop and they get more and more refined over time. And that's the progression of a regular spiral. On the other hand, he said some of them will actually evolve into bars, right? He didn't actually figure out how this happened, right? He just saw this morphology, the shape, the structure, and he, he, he believed that this is what could happen, right? So again, the bar forms and then the arms get more and more refined, okay? So we had, this is called the tuning fork. Now, regulars don't fit, so they're off to the side, right? And I don't think he had seen many irregulars at this point, right? So he basically tried to make them all fit, but here's the progression, earliest, and then these are the end states, right? These are the latest. So he said, you know, spiral galaxies are, are evolved galaxy. They evolve from the elliptical galaxies into, uh, from elliptical into spiral, right? But he was wrong, right? So anybody um, think about, think about the stuff that I've just told you, can you give me one good reason why he had to be wrong, right? One good reason. Again, he didn't have some of this information, but there's lots of information here, right? So I've given you a bunch of clues and I wanna tell you now what really is going on, right? An elliptical galaxy is not the earliest galaxy at all, right? Instead, so what's the reason I'm gonna say that? There's no new stars. If you're a new galaxy, what? You're gonna have a lot of new stars, you have to. So actually, so just to go back a step, I remember I told you that uh, elliptical galaxies are red in color, but astronomers, when they talk about disk galaxies, which have lots of new stars in them, they see the blue color from those galaxies, uh, from those new stars, and so they call the galaxies blue, right? If we say it's a blue galaxy, we mean that it's, it's got new stars forming. And if it's new stars, it's probably a spiral galaxy or a barred spiral, one of those two, probably one of these structures, right? A two-dimensional structure. So now the question is, well, how do you get the ellipticals then? And the clues were number one, no new stars. And then number two, corona gas, violent past. And number three, the number of globular clusters. So I'm not sure if you're figuring it out yet, but those three clues, put them together, tell you a little bit better story, right? And so I'm gonna tell you that he was wrong. Ellipticals don't evolve into spirals. In fact, spirals collide and form elliptical, right? And if you think for a little bit, why would it be that you go from a spiral shape, nice disc, into something that doesn't look like that anymore? And, and the answer is because the two spirals don't have the same angular momentum. They're not rotating in exactly the same way. When you mix together two groups of stars that are rotating in different ways, what you get is a big kind of mess actually. And the overall structure of the final thing is gonna have a mixture of stars. Some of them wanna go like this and some of them wanna go like this. And so you get all of that, right? You get the shape that is more elliptical. So computer simulations show that this is actually why the Andromeda galaxy merger with the Milky Way is gonna to lead to an elliptical. They don't have matched angular momentum. So it produces something you know, kind of like that. Now, if you mix in two different spiral galaxies, it kind of gives you a more elliptical shape, but it might be that one of the galaxies is small and one of them is large. It might be a more stretched out shape in that case. If the two galaxies are very close in size, close in mass, 
And when you mix them together, you might get something more spherical, right? So that mixture of, of angular momentum is really what gives you the different shape elliptical galaxies. Okay, so sorry, Hubble, you were wrong. We have new information. We know that it's exactly the opposite of what you thought, okay, for the reasons that I gave. Um, so lenticular, as we said, is a, is a galaxy that has no spiral arm showing. You don't really have to know much about that, but it has a disc shape. So it looks like a disc, just no spiral arms yet. Okay, so how do we know all this stuff? How have we figured out that the galaxy is, you know, that the universe is so big that galaxies are far apart and actually growing, the distance between them is actually even growing and getting further apart? How do we know all that? And the answer is the cosmological distance ladder, ladder, okay? Which is these various techniques that we use to measure the distance to different objects. And so I'm just gonna, it's not gonna be a real in-depth thing, but just an idea, a concept. And we'll see a few, and then I'm gonna make sure you know some of the best techniques. And I will also let you know that one of them in particular, I don't think is very good. And in fact, it's not widely used, but it's there because it's, it's kind of an intermediate rung on the ladder. Remember the steps of a ladder are called rungs, okay? So we got to start somewhere, right? What is the technique that we use for measuring the distance to the closest stars? You might remember the name of that technique is called parallax, right? So look down here, the first step of the ladder, right? The one that we had to start with, the closest stars as the earth orbits the sun, we can see them changing position. And there was a really wonderful experiment just recently done with the New Horizons spacecraft, which actually took pictures of the stars from its position way out past Pluto. And simultaneously, pictures were taken from an Earth uh, telescope and then compared, and we could see stars moving, right? This parallax shift. So it's really obvious uh, when you get far away, the further you get, the bigger that shift becomes. Uh, also, the stars that are closer to you will shift a lot, and the stars that are farther from you will not shift very much, okay? So that's an important concept as well. But anyways, this is our first step. So the, we're going to learn that we have these different techniques for finding distance to, to stars or galaxies. Um, but the idea is that these techniques are connected to each other. They are part of a single ladder. And to get to the second rung, you have to step off of the first rung. And that's really how it works, right? So you want to get this concept, right? That you can't do a second step until you have a first step. So let's take a look at the second. Uh, actually, so we're going to go through these. Let me just list them for you right here. Parallax, spectroscopic parallax. It's actually not parallax at all. But again, we'll talk about why it's named that. Cepheid variables, which we have talked about, right? We used it to find the distance to Andromeda. There's one called Tully Fisher. And then we have the type 1A supernova, just to remind you, that is a white dwarf with a companion star feeding it. And then it exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit, 1.4 solar masses and explodes, right? And then finally, we'll learn a new one today, which is probably, you know, it's, I, I can't teach you astronomy without leaving you with this one. This is really one of the most important ones today. And unfortunately, uh, we have, not unfortunately, it's actually a delicious, wonderful thing. We do have some controversy right now. Um, but anyways, Hubble's Law is the last one. And up until now, I would tell you it's one of the best, actually. Uh, but I, I do have to tell you about a problem. Okay, so we'll start off with the parallax. You already remember this. The idea is that as the Earth orbits the sun, we take a picture of a star and we compare it, and we see that it changes position. And there's a simple formula, and, and so it's pretty good. It works out to about a thousand parsecs. Okay, remember, a parsec is 3.26 light years. So times three makes about 3,000 light years. How big is the Milky Way? 100,000 light years. 3,000, 100,000, right? This is just a little bubble around us that we can measure using this technique. Outside this bubble, we can't see well enough. We can't measure the parallax well enough. It's too small to be able to determine the distance. There is a parallax, but it's too small for us to, we don't have the technology yet, right? So keep in mind that in the future we will, uh, but right now we just don't have that. So we need a new technique, okay? 
So this new technique we're about to learn is really a cool technique. It's an awesome technique, and it's called spectroscopic parallax. Now, the name was given uh, to kind of indicate that it's a parallax. It's going to measure distance, but it really has nothing to do with parallax at all. It is not a parallax measurement. What is it a measurement of? Well, if you remember, we talked about black body radiation and the spectrum of light that you get is distinctive, right? There's a peak of color and there's a, there's a, a range of colors that you get that depends on the surface temperature of the star. And if you remember, if you, if, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, right? We have something called the main sequence and we have the classification of stars by temperature. What is it that determines the temperature of a star? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. The mass, right? More massive stars have higher temperature. Less massive stars have lower temperature. The mass, right? So imagine we have two stars with basically identical masses. What would we expect? They have the same surface temperature. They have the same spectra. So they are like twins. They weren't born together, but they're twins, right? Twin stars. So what does it mean? We know what their absolute magnitude will be. So if you see one of the twins and then you compare it to another one of the twins and you measure the uh, apparent magnitude of the other one and you know the absolute magnitude of the one that you're looking at, you can say what's the distance, right? So by comparing the spectra, we calculate the distance. Two twin stars, they have the same mass. Now, in order to really make this system work, we had to first connect this rung with the previous rung. So there must be a close star, a star that's less than a thousand parsecs away that we can use parallax with and we can use this technique with as well. And when you put those two techniques together and you say, well, this is the distance, then what is the answer? They have to give you the same distance. And the term for that is making the two distances the same, it's called calibration, right? So you wanna write that term down. Calibration means making the second step agree with the first step, okay? And the way you do that is you find some star or object that's in both of the steps, right? That can be measured with both of the steps. So you need that first step to calibrate the second step and so on, right? Each step above the first one is calibrated from the one before and from the previous ones, actually, from the previous one, but at least from the one before. It's got to be at least one of the steps can calibrate. If you can use more, that's great. It makes it even better, but the idea is at least one uh, from, from the one before that. So this ladder is built from the first step going up to the second step, but the second step is connected to the first step, is calibrated to the first step. And the third step is calibrated to the second step and the fourth and so on, right? Okay, the reason I need you to know that is it turns out that as technology progresses, we will update the values of the first step. We will change our parallax values, right? We will, we will, we will get more precise, we'll get better values. What happens to the latter if you change the first step, even a little bit, does it just change the first step? And hopefully you get the idea. No, it changes every other step above it, right? They have to be recalibrated. Uh, so even though we're just changing the first step, we actually need to change everything else to correspond to that. So this is what's been happening over time, right? We've been able to see uh, major advances in technology that have changed our calibration. So the original numbers that Hubble got uh, when I tell you about his work, do not match what we have today, right? We've just changed those numbers entirely. Okay, so what about our third rung? Let's get to our third rung. We actually know about this one already. It's called the Cepheid variables. And how does it work? We know that a variable star will pulse its brightness, right? And if you measure the time between the, high, the brightest point and the brightest point again, right? That, that's called the period, the time it takes to go from bright to dim to bright again, it's called the period. The period connects to a luminosity. And so by measuring the, or by knowing the luminosity, you can calculate the absolute magnitude. If you know luminosity, you know absolute magnitude. If you know absolute magnitude, you know luminosity, okay? 
And, and from the apparent magnitude, right, what you see, how bright does it appear, compare those two, you can calculate the distance. So this was the one that Edwin Hubble used to calculate the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. Just to remind you how far away, 2.5 million light years away. Okay, so here's our next one. This one, I have to tell you, is more controversial. And by the way, it has a huge amount of error. Uh, but anyways, there are a few cases where other things don't work. And so this is called the Tully Fisher uh, law. It says that the number of stars, the mass of a, of a galaxy, will affect its rotation rate for the outer stars on that galaxy. So more massive stars, there's going to be a faster rotation velocity. And by comparing the rotation velocity, you can figure out the, the luminosity of the galaxy. Again, there's a lot of error. So this is probably my least favorite of the, of the ladders. Uh, but it is used from time to time, and it fills a gap. There's a little gap where, you know, it's hard to use one technique uh, above or below that uh, ladder step. And so you use the Tully Fisher because it's what you have. Okay. All right. Next one, type 1A supernova. This is a fantastic standard candle. So everything I'm telling you about right now is the standard candle, right? You know the absolute magnitude. You compare it to the apparent magnitude. You calculate the distance. Standard candle. The reason that type 1As are such good standard candles is we know the mass exactly. It's 1.4 solar masses, right? Not more, not less. Now, type 2 supernova, we don't know for sure. We just know that it's more than eight solar masses. That's it. But it could be 20, 30, 40. I mean, it could be really big. Okay. And we use the light curve from a type 1A supernova to count at the peak of intensity. We are then able to, to use that to compare to the apparent, the absolute magnitude to calculate the distance. Okay. So our final technique, and this is a really big one. This is actually one that you need to kind of get, get down. There'll be a few questions on your test that are related to this one. Uh, the work done by Humison and Hubble, uh, they very carefully uh, looked at galaxies other than, than the ones that are very close to us in our local group, and they discovered something interesting really interesting. They discovered that all of the galaxies' light was red shifted. Okay, so I just, I'm slowing down because you need to understand this, right? Other than the closest galaxies, every, I mean, every other galaxy in the universe that we can see is red shifted. So, that's a Doppler effect. Anybody remember? What does it mean if it's a red shifted light, right? That means a lower frequency, longer wavelength. What does it mean? The galaxy is moving away from us. The galaxies are moving away from us. The universe is expanding, right? And so this is actually the beginning. This was the beginning of the concept that you and I know so well called the Big bang right so this is the beginning right up until this point people believed that the universe was static it had existed forever all of einstein's original laws were built on a static universe model and then he had to go back and say oops i i made a mistake uh the universe is expanding some of my work doesn't apply it turned out it did he was right but um anyways he thought he was wrong in fact, Einstein's biggest mistake. If you find that interesting and you want to learn more about that, we actually have another course called Black Holes and the Universe, and we talk about some of the really cool details. Uh, but anyways, I leave that for you if you're interested. Okay, so what did they discover? They discovered something kind of amazing, that if you plot the speed of recession, I mean, how fast is it moving away from us, versus distance, you get a straight line, right? Uh, there has there's a special way to plot it, but uh, you know, anyways, don't worry about that. And so this is our formula: the speed that the galaxy is receding from us is a constant known as the Hubble constant times the distance to that galaxy. And so this formula uh, is so simple and yet uh, powerful, right? So this is actually a really big thing. So right now, I, I want you to write down the current value. Now, it may actually be that this is not quite right, but I'm, 
I'm actually not sure yet either. So it may be 71 now, but anyway, I'm gonna tell you that for your test, you should know that the value is pretty close to, or I'm giving you a value of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So you wanna write that down. Now, this, this picture shows you the same thing that Hubble did, but look at, this is the Hubble part. And now you can see that it keeps working, right? This linear nature seems to continue to work. So that's an amazing thing, right? This was just an amazing idea um, and it seems to work. I'm gonna go ahead and, and step into my little, uh, my side show here and talk a little bit about how to use this. So I wanna start off by first of all, making sure that everybody knows what is an MPC, right? So remember that M stands for, is the metric prefix, which means mega which is 10 to the sixth power, a million, right? That's a million. So one megaparsec is one million parsecs, right? Which is, you know, one times 10 to the sixth, which is gonna be 3.26 times 10 to the sixth, three million light years. Okay, now you don't really have to know this, but I want you to understand this, right? So a megaparsec is like 3 million light years. Okay, just to understand that. How far away is Andromeda? 2.5 million. It's a little less than a megaparsec, right? Not quite. But that's the idea. A megaparsec is a big distance. This is what you need, big distances, right? This doesn't apply actually to Andromeda because Andromeda is coming towards us, right? So the light of Andromeda is technically blue shifted, but you have to look far away. So let's try looking uh, at a distance of 100 uh, megaparsecs, right? That's pretty far. That's a long, a long distance away. So how does this formula work? The speed of the galaxy moving away from us, the recessional velocity, it's receding, right? So recessional velocity equals this constant, right? So this H, so this H constant is, I just told you 70, let me write it the way I like it, kilometers per second per megaparsec like this. Okay, that's a better way to write it. So let me write that in, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And then what you do is you multiply by the distance which is in megaparsecs. So that would be 100 megaparsecs. So what happens in this situation? Well, if you remember, this is actually over one if you turn it into a fraction. So this thing is in the bottom and this thing is in the top. What happens when one's in the top and one's in the bottom? They cancel out. So you just get seven times one with three more zeros. That makes 7,000 and the units kilometers per second. So that is the speed of the galaxy receding, 7,000 kilometers per second. Now, again, this formula is so simple, right? Just so simple. This number is supposed to not change. It's a constant called the Hubble constant. What happens if you put in a bigger distance? Of course, you get a bigger speed, but it's better than that. This is called a direct proportion. So what happens if you double the distance, right? Then, right, what happens? So let's try that. If you double the distance, put in 200 megaparsecs, right? Let's try it again. V equals 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec times 200 megaparsec. Megaparsec cancels megaparsec. And then we have two times seven is 14 with three zeros. And you can see what happened. We got 7,000 when we did it this time. And this time we got 14,000, which is exactly double, right? So the greater the distance, the greater the speed. If you double the speed, you get double the, the velocity. If you go 10 times the distance, 10 times the velocity, et cetera. Now, is there any limit on this? And the answer is there's no limit. No limit on V. What do, you, what do I mean by that? 
Okay, so I need you to know, I did put a, a final slide uh, to show you this, but in fact, there is no limit. You can go faster than the speed of light. Whew, that's crazy. Okay, so I just want you to be aware of that. There's no limit. This formula doesn't have any limit. And it turns out that's okay. I'll talk to you about that in just a little bit. Okay, so back to our, our slideshow. Let's go back to our slideshow. So this one is really incredible. This one gets you as far away as you can. Imagine. So let's go back uh, to our, um, let's go back to our, our little outline for a second, just to take a look. You don't need to memorize this, but just to get an idea, you can use this first technique, the first rung, out to about 10 to the third, 1,000 parsecs. The spectroscopic parallax takes you to 10 to the fourth, 10,000 parsecs. The Cepheid variables, 15 megaparsecs, right? The Tully Fisher is good to 200 megaparsecs. You see there's a gap here. So anyways, this is part of the reason. Um, and then type 1a supernova out to 10 to the third megaparsecs. That's 1,000 megaparsecs. But eventually, if you go too far away, you can't see the type 1a supernovas anymore, right? They're too dim. You just can't see them. So now you need to use the Hubble. And the Hubble is good to as far away as we can see. This is the most distant galaxy technique. If you're going to see the most distant galaxy, you're going to calculate the redshift. And from the redshift, you're going to calculate the speed. And from the speed, you can get the distance. Okay. So um, again, the way that you use this is you calculate the recessional velocity and from the redshift, because the faster it's moving away from us, the more redshift there will be. And then from that, you find the distance, okay? So that's the technique, that's how you do this. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about galaxies and some of the, the neat things that we've learned. There are active galaxies and then quiescent or quiet galaxies. And actually, most of the time, our Milky Way has been quiet in my life. Uh, although just recently there was a little spark of interesting stuff happening, and we'll talk about that. Uh, you want to think about what makes one galaxy active and the other not active, right? So um, this is called active galactic nuclei, AGNs, okay? And we're going to come up with a unified AGN model, right? Something that helps us understand that actually all active galaxies have similarities. And the similarities are going to be enough to help us understand why we see different things from different uh, perspectives, different places. Okay, so an active galactic nucleus, just to give you a definition, is a highly luminous energetic galactic nucleus. And what's in the center of it? A supermassive black hole. So actually, um, sometimes, you know, people ask, I'm going to ask you the question, maybe on the test, what percentage of, of galaxies have supermassive black holes? At the center of them and the answer is a hundred percent every single one every single one must have it okay that just seems to be the case but we have an, an issue i would like you to be aware of why right i don't know i don't know in fact one of the the great questions is the chicken came first or the egg which one when did the supernova a uh, super uh, massive black hole come first and help form the galaxy or did the galaxy form and then the supermassive black hole? We don't know. In fact, we want to know. If you could tell me the answer, I would be really happy. A lot of people would be really happy. We just don't know for sure. But it could be, you know, there's two different uh, ways to play that uh, scenario. And they both seem to give you results that are consistent uh, with the galaxies that we see. So simulations have been done in both ways. One where the supermassive black hole was not there and formed after the galaxy, and then another where the galaxy formed because of the supermassive black hole. They both seem to work. Uh, so anyways, all galaxies have one. Okay, so you're gonna learn a few names. One is called a safer, you should write that down. This is actually, again, this has now been, all of this stuff that I'm telling you, in fact, the concept of an active galactic nucleus has supplanted, it's replaced these earlier ideas, but I want you to be aware, a little historical information. Uh, there's something called a Seyfert galaxy, and there are actually two different kinds of Seyfert galaxies. 
and they show broad emission lines indicating highly ionized material moving at great speed. Okay, so we're not talking about exactly why that might be, but anyway, you want to be aware. It's 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 hot. Okay, super hot. Um, and so, yeah, so there are actually two different types. So one is called the type one, and the other is called the type two. And just just to help you understand which is which, a type one shows very strong ultraviolet or and or x-ray emission, okay? So we actually understand a little bit about that, right? X-ray we know comes from incredibly hot things, right? So, and yeah, incredibly hot. Looks incredibly hot, okay? And this type two shows infrared. Okay, so now, hang on a second. Something that is emitting strongly infrared, you would say is not so hot, right? Okay, so like, you know, like we are emitting infrared. So it's not that hot. Okay, so some of these galaxies seem to be hot, but not so hot. And the others appear to be hot. Yes, they're hot. Okay, so what's going on? How could they be, you know, unified, right? We'll come back to that. But anyways, um, our, our unified model will do that. A quasar is called a quasi-stellar radio source. And I need you to understand that the original calculations that were being done by scientists when they found these quasars and then they worked backwards and says what we see is so bright and they thought that the, you know like stars they emit light in every direction right they thought these emit light in every direction but when they went to calculate the amount of energy that was coming out the numbers are mind bendingly big they are so enormous. In fact, nobody could figure out what could create such a powerful thing. They are the brightest objects we've ever seen, right? I mean, it's just amazing. Okay, so we're going to learn that there is a little misunderstanding here. It's not shining in every direction, but much more likely it's coming in a jet. And it happens to be that sometimes we're seeing that jet and other times we don't. Okay. So, but the original calculations showed that the quasars were just phenomenal. This is 10 to the 10th more than our sun, right? I mean, just crazy. We actually had no physical mechanism. There was no way to generate that much energy. We, it was exotic, right? We don't know what happens, right? Okay, so a radio galaxy is a galaxy which just um, emits radio energy. And radio energy, we haven't talked about too, too much like what the source is, but I'll just mention to you that whenever you have a magnetic field and you have uh, charged particles confined to the magnetic field, they're gonna circulate. The speed of their circulation will affect the frequency of the wave that you see that 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 will be emitted by that okay so these spiraling charged particles will actually emit light electromagnetic waves and if they're moving slower you get radio waves and they're moving faster you get higher energy waves they have a peculiar property because they are also called polarized and in fact it's called synchrotron radiation but again we're not going to get into that but the other thing that radio galaxies show is two poles, right? Now, it turns out you can't always see both poles, right? Maybe you can only see one, but you know that there's two poles. Can anyone in this class tell me what those poles are coming from? And I've already given you a clue. But as soon as you see two poles, you know what's causing it. What is the source of that? And I hope you said magnetic field, right? There's a magnetic field there. Whatever's going on, there's a magnetic field, the powerful magnetic field. And there's always two poles of the magnetic field, the North Pole, South Pole, right? Uh, anyways, there must be two poles. And these poles are going to be uh, actually emitting material. Okay? And I don't know exactly how it works. But again, uh, if you have a black hole, you don't normally see the black hole. What you see is an accretion disk around it. And when there's an accretion disk, it will have a magnetic field from that circulation of charged matter. Yeah, I'm trying to give you a little clue. Okay, so let's talk about the similarities, right? What are the things that, that these all will have in common, okay? So number one, they're very small, compact 
uh, cores, right? The cores will be compact. They have a lot of luminosity when they're active. Um, they have strong emissions from the core, and then they'll see also strong emission lines. However, there is some variability in the type of, of, of spectra that you get, right? Some can be strong in infrared, some can be strong in ultraviolet and, and X-ray. And they usually have a, a lot of radio waves coming from them as well. Okay, so that's usually true too. Okay, so what, what happens is that um, these active galactic nuclei are, have been really studied a lot in recent, recent years. And in fact, they, um, we do see something very strange. We actually can see that sometimes when we see jets coming out, they look as though they're moving faster than the speed of light. Now, why is the speed of light interesting? If you remember, the boundary of a black hole, the event horizon, is not a physical boundary. It's a mathematical boundary. And the reason it exists is there's so much gravitational uh, field near a black hole that the escape velocity is the speed of light at that event horizon. If you go closer than the event horizon, it's faster than the speed of light. Well, nothing's supposed to go faster than the speed of light, so you can't get away, which is why it's black. But just outside the event horizon, the speed is a little less than the speed of light. So we can see things escaping from outside the black hole event horizon. And in particular, in order to get away from the black hole, it must be going really fast. Otherwise, it just wouldn't get away. And so we can see things moving at near the speed of light. If it's coming right at us, there's a kind of an optical illusion. We don't correctly measure the, the distance traveled very well or the Doppler effect very well. And it looks as though it's moving faster than the speed of light. We call this a super luminal jet. And at this moment, I want you to, to believe that it's not real, right? It means that you're so close to the speed of light that um, it begins to look like maybe it's faster but we're gonna say that it doesn't actually exceed the speed of light. It shouldn't be allowed to, right? Because of, of special relativity. Um, that would be funny if it turns out that's wrong. But anyways, it looks as though um, these superluminal jets are really not real. So loop superluminal, moving faster than the speed of light. So we really believe those jets are close to the speed of light. So we're gonna try to come up with a, uh, a unified uh, model here to explain all of the different things that I've talked about. And we're gonna we're include a few things. Okay, so number one, the supermassive black hole. Number two, an accretion disk. Number three, this is new, a, a torus or a donut of dust that goes around this. And number four, a halo. And number five, jets that come out of it. Okay, so this, is uh, actually something that we want to talk about. Let's go ahead and draw a little picture for you. So this is what we want to see. Okay, so there is, this is our, our unified model, unified AGN model. Okay, so here it is, supermassive black hole. Second part, accretion disk, incredibly hot, the material that's going to fall in eventually, but is not yet there. And as it circulates, creates a powerful magnetic field, right? But we think that outside of that, there is a torus of dusty material, okay? Now on this picture, you can see a couple of interesting uh, labels. One says uh, Seyfert type one. And you see when we look along this direction, you can see all the way into the accretion disk. And again, what is an accretion disk? It's a very hot, uh, material that's uh, actually a million or 10 million Kelvin. And that means what? It's emitting strongly in the X-ray part of the spectrum, UV or X-ray part of the spectrum. A safer type two, on the other hand, is not looking directly, but looking through the side wall, right? Just depends on geometry, right? Where are you in the universe compared to this, to this galaxy? Are you able to look down the axis or are you going to look along the side? Well, that's just we don't choose, right? We don't get to move and, and see from different angles. If we could, we could see, oh yeah, it changes from safer type one to type two if we move, we just can't go that far uh, and move that fast. So safer type two means you're not looking directly at the accretion disk, you're looking at the dust that surrounds it. And that dust is being heated, of course, but has not reached anywhere near the high temperatures of the accretion disk. 
And then if you're looking right along a jet, we have a blazer or quasar. Let's go ahead and, and go back to that old word quasar. Now, this is the current uh, word that they're using uh, called a blazer. And that means you're right along the jet direction. Okay? So again, uh, we mentioned this with neutron stars, right? If you happen to be in the, in the beam of the jet, then you can see it. Uh, we're not always in the beam, so we can't always see, see pulsars um, as, they, as they shine. And similarly for the active galactic nuclei. Okay, so you don't have to worry too much about the, um, the sizes, just the, just the basic picture. And outflow is the jet together with the movement of material because the, the jet is happening, right? So just like we had outflows with our, our um, protostars as well, similar kind of concept. Um, so, not every galaxy is active. In fact, um, like I said, the Milky Way for a long, long time, actually most of my life, was quiet. But actually, a few years ago, it had a little uh, activity. And in fact, we saw flashes of gamma rays. And uh, again, why is this happening? And the answer is the Milky Way was feeding, right? Something was falling in. And so for a little while, it had an accretion disk, and now it doesn't anymore, right? So the period of time when it has an accretion disk is the period of time that a galaxy is active. And it can take its different amounts of time, right? It could be hundreds of years or maybe thousands, of, maybe even millions of years, but it may not be a continuous property. So galaxies can turn on and off depending on the status of their accretion disk. That's really what it's about. So a galaxy without an, a, a supermassive black hole without an accretion disk will be a quiescent or quiet one. And a galaxy with an accretion disk is gonna be an active galaxy. Um, there is an, a, a correlation between uh, mass and rotation. And actually, I'm not gonna ask you to worry too much about this, uh, but there is a, uh, the stars and the size of the central black hole seem to be connected, maybe. Right, this is really what if, it's called M sigma relation. And the last thing I, I do wanna remind you um, that we've looked at a lot of galaxies now, and one of the things that seems to be ultra clear is that as you get further away from the center of the galaxy, the force of gravity does not get weaker as expected. And the reason is that these galaxies have dark matter. So all galaxies, elliptical galaxies, spiral galaxies, seem to exhibit this dark matter. And the dark matter has a gravitational influence, but does not interact through the, the electromagnetic force or the strong nuclear force. It may interact through the weak nuclear force, we hope, okay? But for sure with gravity, and therefore you cannot see it, okay? So um, Velocity dispersion is the idea that you can look at different velocities around an elliptical galaxy as evidence of the, of the dark matter there. Okay, so I'm at the end of the slides, but I do wanna bring up one final uh, picture for you because there's a question on this test today, uh, the test that you're gonna be taking uh, about uh, this concept. And the concept is the concept of dark energy. I did post a couple of links. I hope that you'll look at those. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and, and just a second, get you to um, a, uh, a little link here. Okay, I'm going to get you to the Big Bang. We're not going to cover this in the class exactly, but I do want to just talk about it for a moment. Okay, you're going to talk about one particular thing. So I mentioned that there's a little bit of a, a controversy right now with the Hubble constant. Um, but before we do that, though, let's take a look right here. Because of the Hubble constant, because of the concept of Hubble, right, that the universe is expanding, right, and that's why we see galaxies moving away from us, we got this idea of the Big Bang, right? So this is not even a hundred-year-old idea. This is a relatively young idea as far as humanity is concerned, but it, it was actually originally... Um, uh, the idea of a Catholic astronomer, as a matter of fact, the Catholic Church had a, a, a very uh, active uh, observatory in the 1920s. And in fact, those observations together with Hubble's work uh, allowed them to create, you know, gave the idea of, of the, uh, the Big Bang. And the Big Bang, um, it's kind of a misnomer. 
meaning it's not the right name. It should should have been called something else. But at the time, it seemed like the right idea. And and so people think of it as kind of an, an explosion. And really, it's something different than that. So it has some of the properties of an explosion, very dense, very high temperature, lots of energy. But in, a, in some other sense, it's not an explosion at all. It's, it's the creation of space-time. So um, one of the, the issues that you know, people have, and by the way, this is a topic that is covered in much greater detail in the Black Holes in the Universe course, which is Earth 106. Uh, but anyways, I'll, I'll just mention a, a couple of ideas for you. Um, what was there before the Big Bang? And the answer is nothing. And there was no before, right? There was no time. Space and time together are what we call space time. And space time was created and expanded in this process, which we call the Big Bang. So that's a pretty bizarre idea. All right, so I, I want to leave you with one final little detail, um, and it has to do with this expansion of the universe. Okay, so it, it's much, much more stuff than I, than I even have time for, but just this one idea. Something is going wrong with the Hubble constant. There's more than one way to measure it. And using these different techniques, the values don't match. They don't match. And it's now to the point where we realize that something is wrong <laughs> and something is wrong. The Hubble constant is not a constant. Okay, so, you know, you're not that invested yet, but there was a time when we needed it to be a constant. And now I'm telling you, it's not a constant. It's changing over time. And in fact, it seems to be that the expansion of the universe is accelerating, going faster, it's speeding up. Now, this is counterintuitive. This is not what we expected. We expected that gravity would slow things down, right? As things expand away, the force of gravity tries to keep them from expanding. But something strange is going on, right? It's almost as if as space-time expands, there's this underlying energy of space-time that must be the same, kept the same. And so as space-time expands, this energy comes to fill in the empty space. And we call this dark energy. And the reason is because we have no idea what it is. We have no idea where it comes from. Don't know what to tell you. But the concept of dark energy is that it is like an anti-gravity force that pushes things apart and is accelerating the expansion of the universe. That's what you need to know. Okay, if you watch that little video clip that I posted for you, it's pretty. It's a pretty good video clip. It helps you see the difference between dark matter and dark energy. But the big issue is that to make it work, you need a lot of it because there's much more empty space in the universe than there is filled space. And so dark energy is everywhere, especially in the empty spaces. So that is our final lecture. Thank you for your attention. And this is our final chapter for the class. So with that, I will leave you. And I hope that you have learned a little bit of something. But I hope more than that, that you are curious to learn more. And that um, when, when we're done with coronavirus and we can go back to normal, you'll come join me for a star party or two and see some of the amazing things that we can see in the universe. But I just want to remind you one last time that you are made of star stuff, that your energy has always existed and will always exist, but not in the form of you. But anyways, that's it. I'm over and out. Dr. Sean Kelly, Santa Barbara City College. And see you outside. Keep looking at the stars. Bye.